Night Show on CCO. Mishki till midnight. All right, campers, let's get to it. I've been feeling kind of funny about this all day today, Niles. This is, uh, this is not like our other conversations going back to May when we started this little venture. We're kind of getting into uh, deep water here, probably. Murky water. Um, and here's what's weird about the water we're wading into. Let me, let me try to hazard a guess as to how many people are listening right now. I have no idea. I don't look at the numbers at 17, all. 17, I think. 18. You wait in the green room. I'm going to do a little bit here, and when I finish, I'll call you or not. Okay. Uh, Flash, how many people do you think are listening? I, I, I hesitate to be way off. It's embarrassing to be way off. Um, I would guess 2,759. That is it? Are you serious? Why don't I just do a little show at home? Can Flash come with me to the green room? He certainly can. Okay. Flash, is that is that what you seriously think? People are a late arriving crowd, man. You know what I was going to guess? 20. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, so I oversold you. No, 20,000. Oh, when you put the thousand on, that makes a big difference. Yeah, well, I thought that's what you figured. I, I thought when you took in 22 states, southern Canada, Twin Cities, I thought 20,000 was a reasonable number. I don't know if you people know I, what I meant 16 or 17. Shut the hell up. Here's, here's a, I'll find out how many. We don't know because the ratings only deal with the 10-county uh, metro. Uh, and there I could see it being, you know, 2,700 or something. I don't know. But uh, when you take in the the big gun, I just thought we'd be up there a little higher. Uh, here, here's what I want to say about this, though. I bet six people total are interested in this topic. And let me tell you why, Niles. Did you, are you wearing a beret? I don't have my glasses on. Did you wear a beret just because we're talking about this? No, it's, uh, a, it's not a beret. No. All right, good. Here's the it's deal. a Viking helmet. Here's the deal. Uh, this is possibly the worst topic uh, to address in the world of art, and yet the most important one. And that's the paradox, and that's what I struggle with today, because here's, here's what we look at with Crazy Bill. Um, the number one artist in the history of mankind, period, end of story. He is it. He is at the top of the list. In the world of art, you get away from building things like rocket ships and uh, uh, doing things with mathematics. You, you delve into the world of, of art, and William Shakespeare is at the top. East, west, doesn't matter. There's no one who touches him, period, end of story. And yet, of these, well, thousands listening, please give me that, six give a damn. And the reason is, he's inaccessible. And you admit in a piece you wrote today that he was for you too. Inaccessible, bordering on boring, because we don't know how to get at this guy and what he did. And I have to admit myself to struggling with this. I bought a book many years ago called Shakespeare's Stories. And what it was was somebody, I don't know who, taking William Shakespeare's stories and writing them in a way that would be more palatable for me. Just writing the stories, getting away from the way he wrote them and just telling the story in a, in a modern tongue. And it was helpful because it helped the story. I, I don't want to read uh, Shakespeare's plays with a dictionary and uh, another book that goes back and studies old English uh, word derivations. I just, it just takes a lot of the fun out of it. So I'm well aware of the fact that we have with Crazy Willie... Um, in fact, I'll read your take on him. Let's be straight and work from this basic precept. 
William Shakespeare is the most important writer, dramatist, poet, and perhaps artist in the Western world, though I don't see how there's any harm in just adding the Eastern half as well, seeing how successfully cosmopolitan his work has proved to be over 400 years. I'll even go further than this and suggest that the complete works, the touchstones being Hamlet, Lear, Macbeth, Othello, and Henry the... Is that four? Henry the Fourth Cycle, yeah. Are the great secular books with the canonical writ of the Bible and the Quran, and more than that, are holier. For as the Bible uh, reveals a writer who is often all too human, Shakespeare is like a god. He's everywhere in his work and yet nowhere. The characters are us, but we cannot locate him. Uh, I would say high praise, but it's beyond high praise. And that's what you get time and time and time again with this guy that he pretty much taught this planet for the very first time in history when he came along what it is to be human i, I mean the superlatives go on and on and on you 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 cannot even be accused of hyperbole um and yet Despite that, so we're now looking at a guy where you're a fool, a moron, a lunkhead, a dunce, a dunderpaid, a, a chowder brain, a moon calf to not spend a lot of time with his work, and yet 99.999% uh, of us don't because, uh, well, there's something cool that Lindsay Lohan's doing at TMZ. I, and the reason really comes down to it's so much work. I mean, the number one novel ever written, I've found it on every list I've ever come across. Ulysses, Ulysses. who the hell reads the damn thing? Nobody. So, uh, what do we I do with this? What do we do with this? What do we do with this? Niles? Well, we could uh, just take, uh, not take for granted the fact that every piece of art that we come in contact with, narrative art in terms of cinema especially, to say nothing of drama and literature, really owes its debt to Shakespeare. He is kind of a Cambrian explosion in the world of literature. And um, before him... You, you had Dante, you had Chaucer, and you had the Bible. And those, uh, and of course, the, the Greek dramatist Virgil in, the, in Rome. But it was Shakespeare who opened up this uh, notion of human personality in a sense that for, for once we were able to observe ourselves talking and speaking, any also opened up language in a way no other writer has. He invented thousands of words, and his vocabulary is um, vastly beyond any other writer's imaginable. And he was so prolific. Uh, I think he was active from the late 1580s and then kind of hung up the towel in 1612 and then returned to Stratford and died in 1616 at the age of 53. But another interesting thing about Shakespeare is that as a dramatist, uh, and a writer, he has the unique distinction of being someone who was equally brilliant in comedy as he was in tragedy. And you mentioned you bought a book about Shakespeare's stories. I should point out that if you work at Shakespeare, and yeah, it is a lot of work, you you kind of do need a footnote guide and to go over things, but uh, the Shakespeare plays are not about plot. He didn't really care about plot. He, he stole plots wherever he could find them and appropriated them. What we read Shakespeare for is the rich characterization, the rich resonances and themes of what he tells us about human nature and the language with the interesting paradox that Shakespeare doesn't really trust language. And uh, you have in Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet and Lear this... Uh, notion of how our language is kind of a prison house for thought. So, um, well, earlier me, this week you were talking about death, I think. And you what were, the you, hell I was? Well, you are always talking about death. Well, we're, uh, and uh, whenever we approach the grand existential questions, I think we have to come to Shakespeare because uh, few artists really approached the... the void of life, the blankness of life, and was able to make it beautiful and and at the same time appropriately Depressing. dreadful. Yeah. Uh, the, the topic tonight, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't uh, picked up on it yet, is not uh, Shakespeare specifically, but because Niles uh, comes on to talk about film, Shakespeare as uh, this artist and his art meets 
Cinema. Uh, you write, whenever a dramatic motion picture strikes us with the strange intensity of its drama, its cutting, hitting, or... I'm sorry. Whenever a dramatic motion picture strikes us with the strange intensity of its drama, its cutting, hitting our bones, such as in the Godfa Godfather films, There Will Be Blood, The Departed, No Country for Old Men, Unforgiven, etc., a rave review will typically have the word Shakespearean attached. The depth of emotions that we take for being the height of our dramatic arts were created by Shakespeare. I take from that that any time any highly emotional dramatic film comes along, it simply could not have been, would not have existed without William Shakespeare. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. The uh, proportions of... Uh, what make a human the kind of complex architecture in terms of how capacious one human being is is something that Shakespeare constantly picks up and whenever we see that in a movie I think a wonderful example in recent years was Daniel Plainview and There Will Be Blood the character of Pla Daniel Plainview played by Daniel Day-Lewis who is a character who is mysterious and yet he seems endlessly deep, and we want him to tell us more about himself in the same way that we want Hamlet to reveal more about himself. Uh, but we can never get there, and we're left with a, a, a really befuddling characterization, which is owed to Paul Thomas Anderson, the director, and Date Lewis, of course, which is never never becomes tired upon repeated viewings. And I think we get the same sense whenever we uh, read a Shakespeare play. Filmmakers who try Shakespeare once can't get enough and want to return. Um, give me examples. Well, you, you, of course, the touchstones for uh, all Shakespeare film production is Laurence Olivier, who did Henry V as his debut film, and then he did Hamlet in 1948, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture, and then Richard III, I think, in 1952 or 53. At the same time, you had Orson Welles, who did Macbeth in 47, Othello in 1952, and uh, most uh, marvelously, Chimes at Midnight or Falstaff from, I think, 1965. Franco Zeffirelli, who did... Um, Taming of the Shrew, Romeo and Juliet, which was extremely popular in 1968, and then the Mel Gibson version of Hamlet. Of course, Kenneth Branagh in our own uh, generation with Henry V, Hamlet, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, Love's Labor's Lost. And uh, tomorrow we're uh, in uh, Minneapolis, The Tempest is being released. That's being directed by Julie Timor, and who she did uh, Titus, an adaptation of the gruesome and I think kind of farcical tragedy, Titus Andronicus, um, in 1999. So, and I think a, a trait about all these directors is that a lot of them came to film from theater, and if you're in theater, Shakespeare is your god. And what better subject to grapple onto than Shakespeare? And the reason Shakespeare is not necessarily your god if you uh, come in to your art uh, through the the medium of cinema is because as you write cinema is primarily a visual experience Shakespeare was ultimately about words I want to throw this question to you Cormac McCarthy writes uh, a book uh, called The Road and it's adapted into a film and the criticism of the film is you have uh, missing those incredible, beautiful sentences that made The Road such a wonderful novel. Uh, again, cinema is a visual experience, and because of that, the film could never match up. And yet, you write, too often adaptations of Shakespeare seem hostage to the words. Uh, aren't you uh, pretty much going to be automatically, simply by taking on the man's work, yeah, hostage to his words? That's the problem of Shakespeare, and that is why... I think the most successful adaptations of Shakespeare have been the ones that don't need to rely on the language, and, and specifically, that is why the best adaptations of Shakespeare are by another director, Akira Kurosawa from Japan, who read Shakespeare as a youth, loved it, and appropriated Shakespeare, adapting Macbeth into a um, samurai film called Throne of Blood in the late 1950s. And I think my favorite Shakespeare film being Ron from 1985, which is an adaptation of King Lear. In that sense, of course, Kurosawa won't have Shakespeare's original beautiful poetry, but few 
filmmakers, I would say you'd have to be in the single digits in terms of comparable directors, were as masterful with their eyes and their sense of handling the language of cinema. And watching Ron with its just its images and um, the expressions of the actor, Tatsuyu Nakade, who plays Lord Hidetora, the Lear-like figure, equals, I think, the immense power of Lear. I think um, Charles Lamb, literary critic, said that Lear is a play that's so powerful that it can't be performed. It's a, a book uh, or a play that you can only read. And that's why when you have Kurosawa taking that material and putting it in, in feudal Japan into his own arena and being able to loosely work with it while at the same time maintaining the breadth of Shakespeare's themes and power that you get in that language, you um, have a work that that uh, succeeds in adapting Shakespeare by existing as its own um, object with integrity. Uh, you write, we heard ourselves for the very first time. We heard ourselves, we being mankind, we heard ourselves for the very first time with Shakespeare, becoming capable of self-observation unlike ever before. It's almost as though the guy held up a, held up a mirror uh, when did he come along? What is it? Was it 1300s, 1200s? When was it? Shakespeare was born in 1564 okay. and uh, began writing in the late uh, 1580s. But he really hit his stride, I would think, uh, around 1595, So that's an uh, awful lot of time uh, where we are civilized people but unable through art to truly present what it is to be a human being. This guy comes along and shows us. That's your take, correct? Yeah, and without I, Shakespeare, we don't even have. Without Shakespeare, we don't have cinema. You're right. Without Shakespeare, we don't have plays. Without Shakespeare, I think without Shakespeare, we're we're extinct like the dinosaurs. Well, I think earlier this week you mentioned that you wanted to kill Shakespeare and or uh, just to see what the yeah, world just would look to see like what without the world him. Yeah. Look like, and yeah. I don't know if we wouldn't have cinema. I don't know if. Uh, how our arts would be what if we different, wouldn't but have they evolved. would be very different. What if, we'd be, what if I kill Shakespeare, I come back to 2010, and we're apes? <laughs> I don't know that that would necessarily be a bad thing. We're going to take a break and come back with the Niles uh, Film Files. If you want to read his tome on Shakespeare and film, you can go to nilesfilmfiles.blogspot.com. More on this after this break. News Radio 830 WCCO. This is the Night Show News Radio 830, the Niles Film Files, talking about what happens when Shakespeare meets the cinema. If you want to read what Niles has written on this topic, and there's a lot to read, it is available at nilesfilmfiles.blogspot.com. I don't know how many words you wrote this time. I'm guessing uh, 5,000. Uh, how long does it take you to write this piece I read today, which came out of my printer for about seven hours before I collected it all and read it? I think it took me uh, about a day and a half. Why do you do it? Why do you write all I, this? I don't know. It's it's something in me. Hmm. It needs to be said. And Maybe how much is available at nilesfilmfiles.blogspot.com as somebody who's never gone there because you simply each week provide me with all the written material I need so I don't have to go there. Uh, what all do you have there? Do you have about 100 reviews? Or? No, I, I only have about, I think, 35 posts up there now. I, I mean, I, took, I brought the site up just a few months ago, I think, and I transported all of the written blogs I had and... Uh, Including your 65-page single-space review of Public Enemies? That's there, yeah. yeah. And I really recommend people try to print out what they see. Even, yeah, even it's though, too much. To, you got to print it out. Uh, because you can't... I don't think you can um, read that kind of stuff if it's beyond a few paragraphs no. on the screen. No. Uh, it should be read on the page, and that's why I, I don't know if I, if I really fit into this whole information age deal, but... Uh, it's uh, it's what I do. It is what you For do, now. and you do it unlike anybody I've ever come across in my life. Uh, is it? <coughs> is that Doug on cough again? People are emailing me now saying, "Tom, it's been over a month. You might want to get that checked out by a doctor." No, it'll go away when I start sleeping. Uh, I don't sleep. 
People are helpless against a cosmos dictating global actions that will determine their fate. Shakespeare's take on life. People are helpless against a cosmos dictating global, global actions that will determine their fate. Shakespeare's take on life. The horrifying dread of existence can be found in all his plays. It, it, where's the joy for this guy? Well... I think uh, if you look at the comedies, there's a lot of joy. Although, if you, I, th I believe that when you see the comedies performed in films, they're performed much too sincerely. Uh, an example being Ken Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing or As You Like It. Uh, there is a lot of mirth in Shakespeare. And, you know, recently you and I were talking about Woody Allen, and I think Shakespeare and Woody Allen kind of have that same position re regarding life and the best that you could do is kind of see yourself as a player on that stage i mean shakespeare believes that you have to look at the world at like a stage and you're just a player in it and the greatest characters in his body of work that being hamlet and sir john falstaff are better than anyone else at assuming the role of a player in that dread theater of the mind. You know what's interesting about what you're just saying right now? I read something recently. I may even have it saved. It talks about uh, studies uh, showing that the more you just play the game of life and just play it, the happier you'll be. The more you step back and observe it, the less happy you'll be. The more you attempt to understand it, the more you uh, attempt to stand uh, on the sidelines and say, what is this thing? the more you are doomed to a, uh, a life of depression. Get in the game and play it, and you'll escape that. I'll see if I can find that, but that sounds like a Shakespearean take, eh? Yeah, uh, but I, I think of the tragedy of Hamlet is that, I think Samuel Taylor, Taylor Coleridge said that Hamlet, his flaw was that he thought too much, and then Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said no, his flaw was that he thought too well. Hamlet understood life too well, and that's what really tore him apart. And it's the same idea, though. Yeah. It's the idea that uh, uh, intelligence and and uh, insight is 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 not a good recipe for. But enjoyment. Shakespeare's great protagonist, I think, much like Nietzsche's idea of the of the uh, Ubermensch or Overman, is trying to strike a balance between looking at life with skepticism and yet at the same time being able to dance throughout it with a kind of gaiety. That's why... But where's the that, gaiety come that, that's from? What, uh, that's where's the gaiety come from? Well, the glass-half-full version of uh, Shakespeare's capaciousness might be Walt Whitman, who is not afraid of that dark side either. But when you read Whitman, uh, you get a, a, a sense of how amazing that dark abyss of life can be. Screw uh, him. Uh, oh. Shakespeare. We're talking about Shakespeare. Where is the joy of life for William Shakespeare? Love. Although it's temporary. So then we're going down a depressing road once again. Here it is. When the mind wanders, happiness also strays. A quick experiment. Before proceeding to the next paragraph, let your mind wander wherever it wants to go. Close your eyes for a few seconds starting now. And now welcome back for the hypothesis of this experiment. Wherever your mind went, the daydreaming is not likely to have made you as happy as focusing intensely on the rest of this column will. This is based on an enormous amount of daydreaming studies cataloged in the current issue of science. A bunch of Harvard guys uh, worked on this, they found the happiest people in the world were the ones in the midst of some kind of project. Um, on average, minds wander 47% of the time. That 47% that of the time is not a happy time for people. It's a fascinating thing. And you know what? I spent some time thinking about this over several days, and I didn't want to believe it because I don't think that's a great way to live. Not, uh, you know, it's the, 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 who, who wrote uh, The Unexamined Life is Not Worth Living? Who said that? 
Some jackass, fat ass choker. Moron. Emerson? I don't know, but whoever it was, he didn't believe in this idea of just Tony immersing Robbins? yourself in. He 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 liked the idea of letting the mind wander and looking at things and. But uh, it's a recipe for disaster, and I have found this to be true in my own life, that the more I'm involved in something and, and immersed in something, the less unhappiness can get at me. The more I just observe the bigger picture, the more it's not that pleasant and the feelings follow. What, what you think Shakespeare would have been uh, comfortable with that take? or no? Perhaps because he was an immensely busy man himself. If we look at the prolific output of his plays, he never seemed to stop writing. And uh, some commentators would say that you don't get a sense of a, a troubled, angst-ridden man writing those plays uh, as you do in, say, other authors, whether it be in our own our last 100 years, I would say Fitzgerald, for example, or um, Emily Bronte, uh, people of that ilk. Shakespeare doesn't seem to impose his personality on the text, and we don't know anything about his biography. He seems to have been in life a very easygoing fellow. And, uh, hard to believe. Yeah, it really is hard to believe when you look at the tempestuous emotions in his work. Um, but it's tempting to almost see Shakespeare not unlike the character of Prospero, the main character in The Tempest from 1612 where Prospero is kind of a magician living on an island, uh, exiled from Naples, where he's the duke. And what he does is he imposes language on nature, and he just uh, defines the chaos around him and makes a beautiful art about it. He doesn't seem troubled by the, the, the dangerous things that are uh, surrounding him, Th which is not to say that Shakespeare didn't have... Uh, strife. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the death of his 11-year-old uh, son, Hamnet, in 1596, really might have been the turning point for him, uh, certainly in the context of the composition of Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear, Othello, which uh, were all kind of written back to back to back to back over the turn of that century. And a lot of it has to deal with childlessness and relationships between fathers and sons, uh, to say nothing of the Henry IV cycle, which is um, Henry IV parts one and two, and Henry V, which we just heard at the be uh, beginning of the break. What's considered the most accessible work for uh, people of the 21st century if they uh, were literally starting uh, from scratch with that guy's work? Let me tell you where I began, and I think Yeah, but that you were 13. I think it's a place that a lot of people begin, though, and uh, that's... Richard III, which is not considered one of the the great plays. It's Shakespeare writing a uh, really good history with elements of tragedy in it before he hit his height. Uh, it has a wonderful pot boiler for a plot, and it has an irresistible character. Uh, I remember being lucky enough when I first got interested in Shakespeare to um, have the Ian McKellen production touring through town, and uh, I basically begged my dad to buy a ticket, and he, he relented and took me. And watching it, you uh, the first scene, I didn't understand what was being said at first, but gradually it took hold of me, and McKellen was so amazing just to listen to, and his expressions were so uh, so powerful that eventually but after a half an hour the whole thing had taken me and i was i belonged to richard i how old were you i think i was 12 or 13 at that huh. time and um that was my first experience of seeing seeing shakespeare on the stage nothing is compared to it this was long before mckellen became a celebrity here he was already a celebrity in england uh but it, it was a beautiful performance and a beautiful production and and that, I think that's a, a way for a lot of people to to uh, enter that world is through, say, Richard III or Titus Andronicus, which is not considered a good play, but has these rather sadistic elements that I think a lot of young people might find irresistible, like um, 
uh, a young woman uh, having her tongue cut out and her arms cut off after she's raped so she can't talk. Quentin Tarantino. Uh, yeah, meets, yeah. Meets and Shakespeare. then Daddy uh, taking the two rapists and cooking them into meat pies and feeding them to her mother to their mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was a relaxed, easygoing guy, Shakespeare was? Yeah. <laughs> I think he, he was actually making fun of other playwrights with that play, like Christopher yeah. Marlowe and Thomas Kidd. But. Uh, Richard III, is that uh, the one that has uh, Now is the Winter of Our Discontent? Yes. I can't think of that without going back to the movie The Goodbye Girl. And uh, Richard Dreyfus is in a uh, theater production of Richard III, yeah. And the guy wants him to play him gay. <laughs> I remember. Do you remember? Yes. And, and you remember when he comes out with the bad arm and the bad leg, and then he's also gay on top of it, and it's just <laughs> he loses his mind because he can't possibly imagine that the reviews are going to be good, and they're not. And But the director wants him to play him gay. I don't know quite why. The, uh, the character of Richard III is noted for being a wonderful hammy part. I think there's actually a Monty Python sketch at the Asylum for oh, Overacting sure. with a, a room full of the Richard the Third room where you have a bunch of actors who uh, doing a, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse over and over again. Yeah. Uh, but you bring up another thing, the the imposition of our own world onto Shakespeare's Elizabethan context, whether we're going to make Richard gay or, as in the McKellen production, uh, they made uh, Richard kind of a 1930s fascist prototype which was effective and i think effectively made into a movie in 1995 did did uh, shakespeare ever uh, write uh, a few sentences that were just pathetic and and deliver a scene that was just embarrassingly bad well yes which I, one i think which we, one? we could uh, go back to i mentioned titus andronicus it's not a a great play by any measure and something we also have to keep in mind is that we're not a hundred percent sure that Shakespeare wrote, even lived, well, even yeah, existed. But, but the plays were being of constantly rewritten. Guys. They were being constantly rewritten over the course of decades, and so there might have been several hands. Next thing you're going to tell me, God didn't write the Bible. Now listen, uh, what do we know about the guy for sure? I've heard uh, people say there wasn't even a Shakespeare. Is that possible? I don't think that's possible. All right. uh, though I, you know, I'm I'm not an expert on the uh, on that theory. I know Freud was a big proponent of it. Uh, a lot of people couldn't believe that this guy from a, a small town, Stratford on Avon, could be responsible for the sublimity of what uh, the first. That's the thing. Was. Nobody can accept that one guy could do this because no it, one had done amazing. anything like it before, and no one did afterwards. I mean, who's the next guy who matches him? Who matches Hit? Uh, I was going to say Hitler. Who matches Hitler? Uh, Shakespeare. I mean, after Shakespeare, who's the next guy who touches him? Did Dante come after? No, Dante was uh, 13th century. Because I have read Milton. That Dante touches him with with at least one work. You mean the Divine Comedy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and wait a minute. Wait, let me let me see if I have the. Uh, I don't mean that Cervantes. Oh, yes, yes. Cervantes. Which is interesting because uh, Cervantes and Shakespeare apparently died on the same day in 1616. Uh, as, as Shakespeare, what he did for drama, Cervantes did with the novel. There had never yeah. been a work like Don Quixote. So let's go to the 20th century. Who's the Shakespeare of the 20th century? Uh, I think if you were to get a bunch of literary critics, they would say either uh, Proust or James Joyce. And who's our living Shakespeare today? I don't know if there is such a figure in literature. And uh, the, the thing is, that, first of all, no one compares to Shakespeare. That's um, just I can't sad. even think of in, uh, say, my favorite uh, arena, cinema, a Shakespearean director to think of someone who matches Shakespeare, first of all, being as expert in comedy as they are in tragedy. Uh, so where did this freak? Prolific. Where did this freak come from? Who the hell were his parents? I wonder. What? I think it's very his, odd. His that dad this guy was came... a glove maker or something. Of like course, that, or yeah. a stonemason. Uh, there's something kind of. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Jesus' uh, dad was. I, a I was just going to say something very Christ-like about yeah. about Shakespeare in terms of where he came from. Can nothing? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I think is the 
the idea. Well, I, I uh, have decided to recommit myself to the original works, going back to the original works and sitting with nine books around me to help explain every sentence and you know, taking five hours to get through a paragraph. I'll do that. Not for you. I'll do it for me, but I'm going to do it because to not do it seems to me to waste, literally waste, uh, a good chunk of life. I just think it's, a, it's absurd not to try again, again, and again. I mean, this will be about my fifth try. Uh, I recommend transcribing. You're kidding. No, it'll, it'll wear out your hand, but uh, it, it really helps in getting to the richness of the work. I think James Joyce, speaking of the richness of Shakespeare, he was asked what book he'd want to bring with him on a desert, deserted island, and uh, he said, I, I would like to bring Dante, but I find the Englishman, i.e. Shakespeare, to be much richer. In other words, you could come back to Shakespeare again and again and again, and it will just... Uh, wrap itself around your mind. And there's, a, there's a great guy I like uh, to read. He writes about Shakespeare, and I like to read people who write about Shakespeare more than I like to read Shakespeare. Bloom, literary critic. Harold Bloom. Yeah. yeah. To read him uh, writing about Shakespeare is uh, it's like reading St. Paul uh, writing about Christ. It is really, and, you, and, and I, can, I can enjoy that as much as reading the man, just sort of seeing him through the eyes of somebody else. But his take on him is that what he can't fathom is that these people were made up, that Shakespeare came up with people who actually did not exist because he said there aren't living people as alive, as real, as three-dimensional, as fully fleshed out. There aren't any living people as, as fully formed as Shakespeare's characters. Yeah, uh, and speaking of Bloom and that idea of the multidimensionality of Shakespeare's characters and the soliloquies with which they talk and teach us things, uh, I think it's Bloom who says that reading Shakespeare won't make us better people or worse people, but it will make us more conscientious people in the sense that we will uh, acquire... Did he say more conscientious or more conscious? Uh, conscientious of how we talk or how we think to, okay. in, our, in our own head. So more conscious, but also more aware okay. of what we're doing, how we are thinking. Well, that's reason enough to go back. Fair enough. How many works do we have? How many, what what the guy produced that we have today? 27? Around 30. 30? I don't know the exact okay. number. And then there's all those sonnets. Yeah. Well, nice work. Uh, we have tackled Shakespeare. We were waiting on this one for a long time. I was afraid to. I, uh, I got up today and was scared. I was very scared, and I went to church. Uh, everything's okay now, though. Uh, the Niles Film Files. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to read more about this man's work, you can go to nilesfilmfiles.blogspot.com. Turn it into a song. NilesFilmFiles.blogspot.com Ring your sister, your daddy, your mom, and read them, and read them, and... I'm sorry.